Good morning, North Livingston. It's good to see everybody in the house of the Lord this morning. If you would, let's stand. and We will open our service with a time of prayer. We have several that are out sick today. We want to certainly pray for uh, all of the family of God, the several that are out today. Uh, we have some traveling today. Pray for those. Uh, some that are recovering from surgery. Uh, praise the Lord. Denise is on her way home from the hospital today. We praise the Lord for that. Uh, been a, a, a difficult week, but we're glad that she is better. Continue to pray for Jim and Margaret. Also, uh, Kathy Adams. Uh, I understand Kathy was supposed to have gotten in last night from Florida. Uh, her dad passed away this week, and so those arrangements are still pending, uh, but I'm, I'm confident that funeral will be sometime this week. So just remember Kathy and uh, the, the Carter family continue to lift them up. Um, do we have any others? I think we've got some in the church that are facing some surgery this week. We want to pray for them. We're glad that John is able to be back with us today. Uh, had some major surgery a few weeks ago and doing better. We praise the Lord for that. Continue to pray for him. Are there others? All right, let's go to the Lord in a time of prayer. Father, we thank you for this Lord's Day. God, we thank you for this Easter season for resurrection. God, we thank you for what that means to us in our life. God, we thank you for Jesus coming, taking our sins. We thank you for Jesus taking that uh, beating, those scourgings that he took, and how that you uh, had Isaiah to prophesy hundreds of years before that that would happen. And that would be part of the atonement, that shedding of the blood uh, that not only purchased our salvation, but purchased our healing. And God also gives us direct, direct access to uh, come to you in prayer without having to go through a, a man or a person. And, and God, we're so grateful this morning that as we just say the name of Jesus, as we just say the name of God, that we are directly into the throne room, the holiest of holies. We have your attention. God, that's humbling to think that the creator of the universe, the creator of us, loves us that much. And so this morning, we just want to pause and say thank you. We want to say that we love you. God, we just want to say how, again, in awe that we are of your provisions for us and that even we can come to you now with these, not just names on a paper, but these are people that you created. You know everything about them. And God, as they've reached out and said, would you remember me? Remember my family? Remember this circumstance in my life? God, those in the room right now that are mentioning those needs that are pressing on them this morning and their family members, their coworkers, their situation, their circumstance, those watching by way of internet, and again, God, just the, the knowledge that we can join our prayers together, our, our faith together, and we can come to you corporately, and we can agree. And you've told us if we would agree that we could come to you in faith, believing, and trust that you hear, not only hear, but you answer. And so, God, we come with that knowledge this morning, with that understanding, and and we come with the, the encouragement of answered prayers. God, some that we've prayed for, for surgeries coming up, and they've had those surgeries this week, and you've just done, they've, they've done beautifully because of your hand. And, and we know you use the doctors and the nurses and the medicines, and we're grateful for that. But God, ultimately, you are the one that we come to, and we're so thankful that you hear an answer. God, we pray for our time together today. We ask for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We're going to be reminded in today's message of just how the resurrected Jesus came to those disciples and how he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And God, just with that, we come with the knowledge today that we ask for the, the breath of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit in this place. God, we ask for the Holy Spirit's guidance as we look into the word. We ask for the Holy Spirit's leading as we lift our voices in song to you. God, we just pray for your will to be done in our gathering today. And we'll be careful to give you the honor, the praise, and the glory because we know in whom we've asked. Because of that shed blood on the cross of Calvary, because of that resurrection, because of that ascension and Jesus seated at your right hand to plead our case this morning, 
we commit all of this into your keeping and all of God's people said, amen. You may be seated. I do want to remind you that if you have turned in your email address uh, for the abuse awareness training and we all that are going to be volunteers at the uh, Vacation Bible School coming up in June, uh, we need to get that training done. And so if you've turned in your uh, email address and there's a clipboard on the sound booth back there where you can do that, uh, then uh, you should have received an email uh, with the link to that training. If you've not received that email and you have already turned in your email address, please let me know uh, and I'll get in touch with Miss Amelia on that and make sure we get that done. Um, the only other thing I've got here, remember May 7th? Uh, and it's on the screen. May 7th is the youth rally at Rocket Arena. Uh, be praying for that, expecting several of our uh, young people from uh, of several counties around to be involved in that. So you be praying for that. And other than that, Miss Joan, I think you have a brief announcement for us. And then, Joe, you come and lead us in a time of worship. I just want to say to you all, we ended up going past our goal for Annie Armstrong. So I want you all to give Jesus a clap and a hand for that. I praise you all, I praise him for you all, for your faithful giving and for being obedient to what God tells you to do. And best I know, Buddy's always texting me and giving me amounts and I'm almost sure that we got $1,870. So just give God the glory. Know that there are people that are meeting Christ today because you give and Jesus sends our missionaries out and he witnesses to the, the people, witness to him, to people. And Jesus, and Jesus is glorified because people come to know him. And just thank the Lord that you all are a gracious, giving people. And God, you will never outgive him. You just will never outgive him. So God bless you. And we pray, continue to always pray for our missionaries. And thank you very much. Good morning. It's good to see each and every one of you this morning. We got any birthdays or anniversaries today? See none. We're going to do a song, I Got Peace Like a River, and uh, just thank the Lord that that's where we get our peace at with all the craziness and, and everything that's in the world. You just get off with the Lord one-on-one -on -one and the peace that he gives you. I don't know what we do without it. <coughs> I've got peace like a river. Sing it out.
Calvary. yesterday and I got out of, I'm off work for a few days and just trying to get out and enjoy what the Lord has made for us and I was just looking at all the beauty yesterday and uh, all the life that's coming about and thank God how great you are and this song has been on my heart anyway about how great thou are and he is so good to us 
Let's just worship him in spirit and truth this morning and think about how great he is. Yeah. 
God, as we bow before you, Lord, in your presence, humbling ourselves before a living God, the one that's in control of everything. Lord, we know we look around that with all the things that's happening, the storms, the storms of life, just all the things that's happening, Lord. We know, Lord, that you're in control. Lord, if you know when a sparrow hits the ground, you know everything. If you know the very hairs on our head, Lord, you know everything. worship you in spirit and truth this morning, knowing that you are God, knowing that you are great, how great thou art. Thank you, Lord, for being in control. Just help us, Lord, to be the people, Lord, you've called us to be. Forgive us, Lord, where we're not. Lord, I pray your anointing, Lord, to be upon Brother Danny today, Lord. He breaks the bread of life to us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to the book of John, chapter number 20. Last week we were in John 19, Easter Sunday. We are now one week out from Easter. And as we follow the story, uh, Mike reminded us this morning not to use the word story when you're talking about the Bible. When we look at the account, uh, because it is true, it's not, uh, the Bible is not in the fiction section of your local library. It's in the historical section. Uh, they say the religion section, but it's more like the historical section because all of the extra biblical literature uh, as well as the Bible itself proving this is true, the extra biblical historical accounts uh, tells us that this actually did happen and that Jesus did die on the cross, that Jesus was buried, that Jesus was somehow supernaturally, miraculously resurrected, that he was with those men and women, that he was with those uh, witnesses uh, for those 40 days, and then that he did ascend back up into heaven. And so <clears throat> coming up very soon in May, we will celebrate Ascension Day. But before we get there, I'm going to ask if you would stand as we read John chapter number 20. And then I want to take just a few moments uh, to remind us, uh, what does this 2,000-year-old uh, account of Jesus and these 11 men, these women, this one man in particular uh, by the name of Thomas, what in the world does that have to do with us in 2023? Uh, we read in John chapter number 20, John, remember John's purpose is to write to uh, the Jewish audience, the Gentile audience, and to get them to understand Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah. The Jews, for the most part, uh, didn't Accept, didn't believe uh, that Jesus was the Messiah, the intended Redeemer, the Son of God. Uh, the uh, Jewish people today, many of them are still looking uh, for this Messiah. They feel like Jesus failed uh, in that he died. But this right here is proof that he succeeded. And John says, I, I write this to you so that you would read this, you would hear <clears throat> this historical account and that by reading this, you would believe that he was indeed the Messiah. And so he tells this account that takes place uh, Easter Sunday, and then he moves forward one week to what we are on today, the one week mark post-Easter. And he says, when it was evening of that first day of the week. Now, this is the, the Sunday night, Easter. Mary has gone to the tomb. Jesus is not there uh, the angel is sitting on the stone 
and Jesus appears to Mary, says, go back into town and tell my disciples that I'm alive. John and Peter run out. They look in. They see that he's not there. They go back to town. They're in the upper room. They're locked away because they are afraid that what the Jewish people, what the Roman authorities did to Jesus, they're going to come and do to them. And so John says, we were gathered together with the doors locked. And the King James says the doors were shut. Uh, that means the doors were locked because we feared, they feared the Jews. And get this picture in your mind. Jesus came, the doors are locked, and yet Jesus stands right in the middle of them. And Jesus says, peace be with you. And having said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And after saying this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. And if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And John says, but one of us was notably absent. Thomas, verse number 24. But Thomas called Didymus, which means twin, one of our 12, was not with them when Jesus came. So John fast forwards here and he tells some of what happened the rest of the week. All of the disciples get Thomas and they corner him and they say, oh, you should have been at church Sunday. You don't know what you missed. If every time somebody misses church, the rest of us would just call them and say, you should have been there. You don't know what you missed and hang up. <laughs> don't tell them. But the disciples were telling him, we've seen the Lord. And Thomas said, if I don't see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger into the mark in his side, I will never believe. You ever met somebody like that? I don't care what you say. If I don't see it, it ain't happening. That was Thomas. Verse number 26, John says a week later, that's today, his disciples were indoors again. That means they were behind locked doors. And this time Thomas was with them. And even though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he turns to Thomas. He says, Put your finger here. Look at my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side and don't be faithless. Don't be an unbeliever. Believe. And Thomas responded to him, my Lord and my God. What a proclamation for a Jew. My God. And Jesus said, because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed, more blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. That's you and me. And Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. I wonder what those are. I wonder what other miracles Jesus did and John said I just don't have time to write it down that's the Jesus you serve but John says but these are written verse number 31 but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah the Son of God and that by believing you may have eternal life you may have life in his name father we thank you for this account of this man that was present on that Easter Sunday and that following Sunday that saw and took time to tell 
about the resurrected Jesus. More importantly, about this man who didn't have much faith and he doubted and he admitted he was honest with himself and with those around him. And more importantly, he was honest with you, God. May we learn to be honest with you. May we admit when we have fear of failure, when we have lack of faith, when we're questioning life. And yet may we learn just as Jesus responded to Thomas, how Jesus is waiting to respond to us. And may the Holy Spirit's anointing be in this place as we discuss this, these next few moments. And may the Holy Spirit change our hearts, our minds, our attitudes, our intentions. And may we be like Thomas to be able to look at the evidence and be able to say, my Lord and my God. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. So here we are one week later. I've told you that as a pastor, sometimes there's Sundays when you wonder what you're going to preach on. What am I going to share? And you pray and you ask God, so what do we talk about? Today, what part of scripture, what part of the events, what part of life do we talk about today? And we approach the Christmas season and it's kind of built in. We're going to talk about the birth of Jesus. And then we kind of wind up to Easter. Easter's like the Super Bowl for a preacher. I, I made the statement last week, I may have made it, even made it here that that. Uh, uh, Easter's kind of like getting to be the quarterback of your favorite football team when you're a preacher because you get to make the important play to share the good news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then it's the week after. Back to normal. What do we talk about? Well, that's the way it was for these disciples. It was anything but back to normal because of what had just happened, their world had just been turned upside down. You know, an encounter with Jesus will, un, will un, upend your world. An encounter with Jesus should make a difference in who you are and how you behave and the way you conduct yourself. And so it was with these men here one week after Easter, the excitement of all that had happened and so we ask ourselves, so what has this week done for me? What, what, what has the resurrection meant in my life? What has the fact that I serve a risen Savior, we sing that song, what does it do for us? And then we read the account of what happens here with these men, these women when they're in that room and we see their, their honesty, their fear, their fear of failure, their fear of the unknown, what next? And if we're honest with ourselves, we all go through those times in life when we have to question our faith, we question our actions, we question our circumstances, we question why life is happening, what now, what next? And that's where these men were, that's where these women were, what, what next? And then the supernatural intersects with our humanity. The way that God always does when, when the supernatural impacts our life. When we get honest with God and say, God, I don't know what the next step is. I don't know what the next decision is. I, I don't know what to do here. I don't know what, what choice to make. I don't know what decision to make. I don't know what to do. And we pray, and then God answers. God comes on the scene. You know, every time the supernatural interacts with our natural world, you have one of two things said, peace or don't be afraid. Every time you read in the Scripture, every time the supernatural, every time an angelic being, every time Jesus would come into their life, 
it would be one of those two things. Peace, peace. Joe didn't know what I was going to talk about this morning. But when we sing that song, I've got peace like a river. You know how powerful a river is? You know how forceful a river can be? How defining a river can be? I saw a picture this week of Smithland down here where the Cumberland River runs into the Ohio River. If you've ever crossed that bridge and looked over to see where those two rivers come together, have you, have you, have you ever looked at that and you see this, that clear line of color where you can see where the Cumberland stops and where the Ohio picks up? And there's, there's no question where is the line. One of them is just kind of greenish, bluish, and the other just brown as can be. And you know that that river has a definite boundary, a definite line. Peace like a river. The peace of God. The first thing Jesus did when he appears in that room behind those locked doors, just like the angel sitting on the stone when the women get there, they, God knows, Jesus knows, the angel knows. This is going to be a little different for you humans, and so you need to understand, just take a breath, calm down, I'm here. It's going to be all right. Now, Jesus didn't say your world's going to be easy and no problems, but he said peace. You know, Jesus has said before, my peace I leave with you. In fact, in this whole reading here, twice Jesus says peace. When he appears Easter, he says, peace be unto you. And then when he appears, when Thomas is there, he says, peace to you. I think that second time, while John says he couldn't tell us everything he did, I, I think that second time, that message was just for Thomas. The other 11 had already heard it. They had already heard, peace be unto you. And then Jesus had breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And all through Jesus' ministry, Jesus had been telling them, it's necessary that I die. It's necessary that the cross happens. It's necessary that, that I go back to the Father because if I don't, if this doesn't happen, if I don't die, if I don't go to the cross, if the resurrection doesn't happen, God can't send the promise of the third part of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. That's not going to happen unless I do this. And so like we talked last week, Jesus on that cross said, it's done, it's finished, it's completed, it's paid. And now Jesus appears to them and Jesus says, peace. And then he breathes on them and he says, receive ye the Holy Spirit. I told you it was going to happen and here it is. But Thomas wasn't there. I think John looking back and thinking about this, John had already described Thomas as a pessimist. John had already described Thomas as an honest skeptic. Thomas is one of those, you've got to show me the proofs. And so it's not surprising that when they were all there, and for whatever reason Thomas wasn't, maybe it was because of fear of the Jews. Maybe he just thought those locked doors aren't going to protect us. Maybe he was still trying to figure out, am I going to trust Jesus? Am I going to... You know, you, you got to consider that sometimes when you're talking about your eternal destiny. Am I going to trust what the preacher says? Am I going to trust what this book says? Am I going to trust what my Sunday school teachers and my VBS teachers? And am, am I really going to depend on this for my eternal destiny? Do I really believe this? God knows we have questions. We're created in His image. And so Thomas is identified by John, and Jesus knows Thomas. And all week long, they've all been badgering Thomas. All week long, they've been saying, if you would have just been there, if you would have just seen how he just appeared in the room or how he walked through the wall or he just, he wasn't there and then he was there and then he was gone, you should have seen it, Thomas. 
Well, how do you know it was him? How, how are you sure? I, how am I going to trust just your word on this? He had the, the nail prints in his hands, Thomas. He had the nail prints in his feet, Thomas. He, he, Thomas, don't you remember how that, that, that soldier took that spear and pushed it in his side? And Thomas, that's going to leave a mark, right? Well, Thomas, we saw that mark. I'm sure Mary had said, Thomas, when we got there, you should have seen the, the angel was sitting on that stone. It was moved and those soldiers were just passed out. And I didn't even recognize him when I saw him. And, and then he called me by name and he told me to come and tell the guys and I came. And you'll remember Peter and, and John went and they looked and they told you the same thing. He's alive. And all that they told Thomas all week and everything all week trying to tell Thomas. And his response was always, I won't believe it until I put my hand in those holes in his hands. Until I, you read how he said that. Until I thrust my hand into the, the, the forceful way he said that. Until I thrust my hand in that hole in his side, I I won't believe. I'll never believe. And somehow they got Thomas. You know how you do your friends sometimes? Just come and go with me. Just, just come and see this. Thomas, we're going to get together again the first day of the week. We're going to get together again and we're just going to pray. I mean, he said to tarry and pray and, and we're just going to pray. And Thomas, we don't know what's going to happen. He may be gone, Thomas. He may have already gone back to the Father. He, he may never, we may never see him again, Thomas. We don't know, but we need to stick together. <coughs> and so Thomas agrees. He comes with them. And they're there. The doors are locked. It's only a week later. They're still afraid that they're going to be next. I can just see Thomas. He's sitting on the bench. He's got his legs crossed. He's got his arms folded. He's got his eyebrows furrowed. Maybe Peter's talking. Maybe John's talking. He's sitting there. But he's mumbling to himself, I'm not going to believe. You're not going to convince me. Tell me all you want until I see him. I just don't think it happened. How, how, how can it be true? How you know, you question sometimes, how can God just speak the word and worlds came into existence? How could God take the dust of the ground and make a man? How could God put that man to sleep and take a rib from his side and make a woman? How could God create the oceans and the ocean just as vast as it is? The tides only come so far on the shore. How could God make rivers like the Ohio and the Cumberland when they come together, they don't run the, the Cumberland, the Ohio never backs up into the Cumberland, the Cumberland always goes in. How can, how does that happen? Is there really a God? Is there really a heaven? Is there really a hell? Is there really a life after this? How can it be? Just like we question Thomas questions. And Thomas is sitting there, legs crossed, arms crossed, eyebrows furrowed. Prove it to me. And right in the middle, of somebody doing whatever they were doing that day. Doors locked, they double checked them. And whether he walks through the wall or whether he just appears, there's Jesus. But this time, Jesus doesn't turn to Thomas and say, oh, Thomas, you fool. Jesus doesn't turn to Thomas and say, oh, Thomas, you know better. He doesn't criticize him. He doesn't fuss at him. 
I mean, it's easy for us to say, oh, tisk, tisk, Thomas, doubting Thomas. How can you not believe? And yet, how many of us in our lives have to admit there's times when we just don't have the faith? We just don't trust. We just don't know. That was Thomas. If every one of us are honest with ourselves, we've all been in that state of doubt that Thomas was in. It's our very nature to doubt what we cannot see. And God knows that. We're created in his image. He made us. He's the reason we are who we are and what we are and how we are. It might as well be us sitting in that room with those 11 as it was Thomas. Reminds me of a story I read some years ago about a guy who was walking and <laughs> kind of a funny story, probably a, well, no doubt a made up story, but it gets the point. The guy was walking along and he was enjoying God's nature. Maybe somewhere like over in the garden of the gods, you can picture it. He's walking along, along the cliffs, the edge of the rocks. You've probably heard the story. He, he walks along and he gets too close and he slips and he falls over the edge He's out by himself just enjoying nature. And as he begins to fall off of the side of this cliff, there's a tree growing out from the cliff. And he grabs a hold of that tree and he's hanging on after he's fallen over the edge. And it's too steep to climb up and it's too far to jump to go down. And he's in a predicament. What does he do now? He can't see a way out. So he begins to think, well, is it just, just a chance in a thousand, but I have no other way to do this. So he begins to yell, help, is there anybody up there? Help. And he screams and he screams. And finally he hears a voice. And the voice is God. He says, I'm God. Just turn loose of the branch and fall and I'll catch you. And he thinks for a minute. And he looks down. That's a long way to go to trust that God's going to catch me. But if it's God, so he calls back, he says, God, don't you have a rope or a ladder or something? And the voice of God says, let go of the branch, fall, trust me, I'll catch you. And he begins to think again, that's a long way to fall. And now he shouts out again, is there anybody else up there? Sometimes we can't see the answer. And God has the answer, and yet we would call back to God, is there not some other way? Is there not somebody else? Thomas had walked with Jesus those three and a half years, just like Peter and John, just like Mary. Thomas had seen the miracles. Thomas had seen Lazarus brought back to life. Thomas had seen the the leprosy healed. Thomas had seen the lame walk. Thomas had seen the blinded eyes open. But this, this resurrection was a bit far. And so Thomas is sitting there, just like you or I, with the questions of life's challenges. Do we believe? We struggle just to accept it on faith? what somebody else says. And yet we find ourselves like Thomas, even though we want to criticize Thomas, until I see it, I'm just not going to believe it. And Jesus shows up. And Jesus doesn't leave us to sit there in our doubts. Jesus comes in the room and just like Jesus said to the others, Jesus says, peace. Don't be afraid. It's me. Jesus doesn't lecture Thomas. Jesus doesn't chastise Thomas. Jesus doesn't discipline Thomas because of his doubts. Instead, he wishes him peace and he extends mercy and he helps Thomas to move beyond his doubts. Look at what Jesus does. Thomas had said, until I put my fingers in the nail prints in his hands, until I thrust my hand into his side, I will never believe. So what does Jesus do? 
Jesus says, here, Thomas, put your finger in the print. Jesus says, put your hand in my side. John never says that Thomas ever moves to touch it. It's just Thomas seeing Jesus' willingness. And Thomas being the Jew that he is, he makes one of the greatest pronouncements that a Jew can make. My Lord and my God. He had been Lord for three and a half years. They had followed him for three and a half years. They had put their trust in him up to a point for three and a half years. But on this day, and John doesn't say, John says, I can't tell you everything that he did. There's just not room to write it down. But I believe, I believe that Jesus did exactly to Thomas what he did to the other 11. I believe he breathed on him and he said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Because what happens when you receive the Holy Ghost? You're born again. You're regenerated. You're redeemed. Your world changes. And I believe Jesus breathed on Thomas when he said, Peace. And he said, Tom, receive the Holy Ghost. And I believe at that point, Thomas was born again. Just like the other 11 had been the week before. In that crowded little room, door locked, sitting with the other 11. The question today is, where do you sit? You see, I told you when we read these accounts, we have to ask ourselves, what's that got to do with me? What's it got to do with mine? What's it got to do with where I am? Where are you sitting today? Oh, it would be good to say, well, I'm like the other 11. I was telling Thomas all week, you should have been here. You should have seen what I saw. You should have experienced what I, 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 I got saved. Great. Praise the Lord. Or are you sitting where Thomas is? I'm just not sure what to do. I'm just not sure how God's going to work this out. I'm not sure what tomorrow holds. I'm not sure what's fixing to happen in life. I don't know about the relationship. I don't know about the finances. I've never been down this road before. Haven't we all been there? If you haven't, let me assure you of something that I've learned in 58 years. You're going to be there. You're going to be in that situation where you just don't know what to do next. And in those times, it's good to be able to reach out and to say, God, I need some help. Jesus, I need the answer. Jesus, I need your peace. Jesus, I need the Spirit right now to guide me, to give me discernment, to give me wisdom, to help me to solve these doubts. Wherever you sit today, I encourage you to look at Thomas. Not very many preachers are going to tell you, well, look at Thomas and do like Thomas did. Really? Doubt? Don't look at Thomas as a bad example to be avoided. Look at Thomas as our representative in that room. An honest skeptic. A man that had honest doubts. And you know, one thing I found, as long as we're honest with God, there's nothing that God won't take care of for us. We just have to come to God honestly. God, I just don't know. I need your help. I need your direction. And when we do come to God honestly with our doubts and our wherever we are, Jesus stands before us in the middle of impossible circumstances, doors locked. And Jesus stands there inviting us to see just as he did to Thomas You don't have to reach out and touch it. You just have to say, okay, God, guide me through this. 
so that we will know, we'll know the truth, the word, we'll know what God's intentions are. And then we can stand with Thomas and we can say, my Lord and my God. How many times have I been in the place where I'm able to say, you did it again, God. You did it again. Coming into this, I didn't see how it was going to work out. I wouldn't have fixed it that way. I didn't see those circumstances turning into this situation, but you did it again, God. And for that, I'm thankful. So the title of today's message is Back to Normal. I don't know that normal is, I don't know what normal is. I don't guess any of us do. But with God, we don't have to know. We just have to trust and ask. Joe, come and lead us in a hymn of invitation. Where are you sitting today? Are you sitting where the other 11 were? Questions answered, you're in a good place. Are you sitting where Thomas is? You've got your questions and your doubts and they're still unanswered. And wherever we find ourselves in that line, that spectrum, on that line of continuum, that, that, that place in life, just know that when Jesus comes in, Jesus says, peace. Don't be afraid. Trust me. I've got this. We'll figure it out. As you stand, Joe, what are we singing? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. If the Holy Spirit speaking to you this morning and telling you to step out, you make use of these altars. If the Holy Spirit's telling you to go, take somebody by the hand and offer to pray with them, just to be obedient to what the Holy Spirit is asking you to do this morning. Would you put the first screen of the second verse there? Look at that. Through death into life everlasting he passed. That's what he did. Easter. And we follow him there. Over us sin no more hath dominion. For more than conquerors we are. A lot of scripture in that little phrase. We are more than conquerors.
Thomas didn't feel like a conqueror that Sunday sitting in that room with those other 11. But when Jesus came in and Jesus said, peace unto you. How many times do we need the peace of Jesus in the middle of this chaotic world? And instead of watching the news and listening to other voices, we would do well just to remember who we serve. He passed from this life into life everlasting. He took our sin and because of that, sin no more has dominion. doesn't mean we're not going to sin, but it means it doesn't have dominion over us. It doesn't have control over us. Death has no hold over us because through him, we are more than conquerors. Remember that as you go forward. I'm glad that you're here. Thankful to see each of you here. Pray for those, some that are traveling, some that are out sick. Continue to pray for them, lift them up. Some coming home from surgery from the hospitals, they still have a road of recovery ahead of them. Continue to lift them up and pray for them. All hearts clear. There's a note being held up that I can't read right back here, but that's what it says. <laughs> Joyce needs to meet with the women uh, right after service to get the meal train going for Denise. And anybody that has good directions to Slocum, stay for the meeting. All right. Kathy, it's good to see you back. You're in our prayers. We love you, sister. We're praying for you and your family. Praying for you through this week. Kevin, it's always good to see your bald head. Would you close us in a word of prayer? Yeah, it's all to you. Thank you.